Hello, good evening, welcome to the School of Resistance here at the Academy of the Arts in Berlin. My name is Dorothy Wenner. I'm a filmmaker and curator based in Berlin. And I'm very happy about the invitation to moderate tonight's session around the Congo Tribunal. I'm very happy not only because I'm here with all the esteemed colleagues and with our guests, but also to partake in this transdisciplinary program, which I, for not the first time, but especially for the last two days, I enjoyed because I got a lot of inspiration and also encouragement, for which I would like to thank the other panelists who have participated so far. So tonight, the Congo Tribunal will be center, the film that you've just seen and watched. Uh, the Congo Tribunal is a central piece of Milo Rau's work. Like many of his other works, it's not one piece, but it has transformed, it has grown, and it has existed, if I'm not mistaken, maybe for the long, one of the longest times of Milo's project. It started in 2015. Various hearings took place in various places in DRC, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, here in Berlin, and most recently, in Zurich with the last episode, the Colvesi hearings. Um, Milo has also written a book, which conveniently I may show uh, to you. And uh, the Congo Tribunal has also a whole network that surrounds this long-term observational project. And this is what we will learn more about from our esteemed guests. So I will introduce the first two guests which are present with me here on screen. Our third guest, Noa Cipomire, she will join us shortly and we will welcome her once she is on air. My um, first introduction would be to Mrs. Celine Chizena. She is a human, human rights activist and lawyer. She has been involved with the Congo Tribunal from the very beginning. She was uh, one of the investigators in the 2015 edition and in the following years she has uh, continued to investigate and uh, recently, most recently, she has also um, been the head investigator when the uh, Congo Tribunal went to Zurich and this part of the hearing was uh, in um, trying to, to find out what is the situation with the Swiss giant Glencore. Uh, she has uh, participa participated in over 20 hearings. I think Celine is joining us from Lumumbashi where she is based but None of us was quite sure. I think you are joining us from Lumumbashi. Welcome. With me also is already Professor Dr. Harald Welser. He is a sociologist and social psycho psychologist. He is the co-founder and director of the Foundation Futur 2, associated to Berlin-based daily DITATS. The foundation is also called Zukunftsfähigkeit. He is a permanent visiting professor at the University of St. Gallen and head of the Norbert Ilias Center for Transformation Design at the University of Flensburg. Very prominently, he is in the German discourse for everything that, uh, that relates to sustainability, a subject that he has published numerous books about. And uh, he's been a long-term collaborator with Milo Rau, in the Congo Tribunal, he was present as one of the investigators in the 2015 hearing, which all of you have seen in the film. I would like to open for an introduction with an observation that I, I'm sure many of you have experienced as well. When you see films these days in the pandemic, uh, that there are those moments where one suddenly realizes how much this new world situation has influenced our way of looking at the world. And my first question to both of you, knowing the project so intimately well, knowing the film so very well, when you see the film today, do you experience these moments? Do you have these moments where you feel, oh, this was so different by the time released first, which was in 2015? 
I don't know, maybe Celine, you would like to begin. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I would like to greet everyone most warmly. So when it comes to this COVID-19 pandemic, it is true that this has changed things a lot. And of course, the Congo Tribunal was supposed to go on, was supposed to travel on and be held in February here, but it was then postponed due to the pandemic as well. Because, of course, due to the pandemic, we were not allowed to meet up with multinationals and governments, so we couldn't push things forward because of the lockdown and because of the different ways of uh, coping with the measures that were taken so that people don't get in touch too much in order to prevent the disease from spreading out. So we've got a lot of delays, so we had to delay and postpone quite a number of things. So it would have been successful if we had been able to hold the uh, Congo Tribunal here in February. Celine, I'm sure we will hear much more about this, what happened between the first tribunal and the uh, uh, hearing that was supposed to happen end of February, uh, so this very month. Uh, but before, Professor Welzer, I would like to ask you, um, when you watch the film today again, four years after it was first released, what are the moments where you feel like we are living today in a different world? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Because if you if you have been part of a film, it's interesting to see it again. And for me, the experience is much more remembering the situation when all this took place. Yeah, the, the Congo Tribunal. Um, if I if I watch movies uh, that have nothing to do with my situation or my experience or whatever. Um, I sometimes wonder how people behave when they gather or when they shake hands or when they hug uh, and whatever. So we have now a situation where our um, social habits, our social conventions, as everybody knows, are totally different from the year before. But to my experience, this is not something that comes into my mind when I see, see this movie again. Mm -hmm. um, Celine, you're the one who, who has been on a very long journey with this project together with Milo. And for those people in our audience who have just watched the film and have not seen the various trials, the hearings, uh, maybe have not writ, uh, read the book. Would you be able to summarize for us and our audiences what has happened since the first tribunal, uh, tribunal during which the film was shot? Uh, and what is now? This is a long and big question, but I think it's quite necessary to understand what we are talking about. Yes, of course, I'd be glad to do so. So when it comes to the Congo Tribunal project, it all started out in the beginning of 2015. And of course, I also contributed in the second phase, Kurumbashi. And when it comes to the first stage of the project, I am aware that it was more focused on um, crimes and mm -hmm. wars in East Congo and, and the exactions of the mining companies there. But then in Kolwezi, in the Congo Tribunal, in the second phase, we rather investigated and looked into questions of corruption, of pollution, environmental pollution, and how multinational companies 
misbehaved and we've interviewed quite a number of people, so around about 20 witnesses coming from all sorts of different categories and each and every one tried to provide their own opinions when it came to the different cases that we focused on. So we looked into issues such as corruption, tax fraud and amongst other things we also pointed out some environmental issues and in particular the Tabue dam issue where there was an accident of a tank truck that spilt over and that destroyed large parts of the environment on the ground and this has given rise to a lot of suffering. People disappeared, there was an acid accident. So we've met up with quite a number of people that told us about the facts that took place during the accident. And apart from that, what we've been trying to do is to find out how uh, those uh, events take place in mining sites. So we had access to miners in private mines, and this is where we had some exchanges with people that were victims of accidents where the company was not able to provide remedy or did not accept to pay compensation to people concerned, people falling victims to these accidents. And just like we said before, I believe that the Congo tribunals are just one way of demonstrating who is involved and to show it to the stakeholders, i.e. to Congolese authorities, but also to other administrations and people of civil society and victims. And we try to bring together those different parts of reality to find out whose rights are impacted. But unfortunately, now with the investigations that we've carried out, not just me, but also my colleagues, we've found that the different stakeholders, in particular Congolese authorities, of course, have to take responsibility, but unfortunately, they don't take those events seriously. They don't take the allegations seriously at the cases that took place in the mining sector. So if I were to summarize, just in a nutshell, at the moment, when it comes to the Congo Tribunal investigations, we've revealed some major cases that had an impact on the population, population living on the ground in the area where mining companies are active just like we did in the beginning and also uh, an agreement was reached with Colwasi and Kongwishi, but now we need to see to it that the rights of the ambient population are respected. We need to wait and see and find out how we can go on with the tribunal that was supposed to take place here at the end of February, but unfortunately with the pandemic we were not able to hold it. And this is given rise to some problems, but this is what has happened in the second phase in Kolongji and Mombashi. Thank you very much, Céline, for this very insightful overview. Um, I think later on tonight we will also hear a little bit more about, from your perspective, um, what actually has changed? You were mentioning that things have changed. How have they changed uh, for the local community? This is something I'm sure we will come back to a little later in the evening. It is now my, um, my chance to say hello to Nora Chipomire. She She's joining us. Hello. No hello. Hello. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, so I interject uh, the questions and uh, it's my big pleasure to give a short introduction to Nora Chipomire, very well known choreographer, dancer, theater artist uh, based in New York. And maybe you're joining us from 
New York, or where are you? I am in Brooklyn, New York. In Brooklyn, New York, uh, where she is based. Uh, Nora Chipomira is a well-known name to everyone who um, is at home in the world of theater, performance, dance. Uh, she has performed practically all over the globe, of course, also in Germany numerous times. I'm sure many of your fans will be watching. For those of you who uh, might not have had the pleasure of seeing you performing, a uh, little bit more about your background. Um, Nora was born and raised in what was then still colonial Rhodesia, born in a, in a place which was then called Umtali, now Mutara, Zimbabwe. And she says in her biography, she's a product of colonial education for black Native Americans known as Group B schooling. Maybe uh, Nora, a little later, she will tell us um, why this was such an important aspect for you in your life. Uh, those people who are familiar with your work, we know um, that you have dealt with, for instance, uh, your immediate family background. One performance was um, related to your father and your father's biography. Um, when it comes to the co collaboration with Milo Rao, on several projects you've worked together. The most recent was a book, Why Theatre, which unfortunately is not on display, or is it? No, it's not. But um, Why Theatre was a book that you and Milo worked on together. And this very question, oh, Milo, <laughs> please let's make a promotion. <laughs> okay, so here's, <laughs> thank you, Milo, for showing this. Um, proof that he's here with us. Um, so why theater is the question that uh, the two of them, together with others, ask many uh, theater professionals and activists around the world uh, with a particular background of uh, last year's uh, summer uh, pandemic. And uh, before you were also involved in the project, The Art of Resistance. So both of you have also uh, a history of having very long, very lively debates, which is, if anyone is interested, can see on YouTube. Um, Nora, I asked the two other guests also, so maybe to rope you in for the beginning. You being very familiar with the film, I hear you like to show the Congo Tribunal to your students. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder, when, when you see the film now again, after it was shot in 2015, released in 2017, when you watch it today against this pandemic situation, which are the moments where you feel the world has changed or where do you see, where do you watch the film differently from when it was made and released? Um, wow, that's that's that's. Uh, uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. What a what a uh, beautiful question uh, because it's also extremely horrific. Because when I watch it now, I don't feel that the world has moved. I think we have moved closer into the heart of the darkness. In fact, I, I think we are right there. Uh, for me, there's uh, very little distance. When I watched it before. I was uh, traumatized uh, as, as an African who grew up through a revolutionary struggle and kind of know what warfare and, and, and death and dying looks like. Uh, so to, uh, when, I, when I did see it, I, I thought the audacity of this crazy white man to put uh, this uh, for the world to see. Um, and my students uh, also, uh, have you know equal equal rage uh which i think that is exactly what milo wants us to feel is is that rage so watching it now in 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 this period of the pandemic the rage is even more uh multiplied i, I you know I, I i feel less of a of, of a distance uh, that the gap has closed that we are inside of of of, of the darkness now um, so yeah, horrors upon horrors, if I may quote that uh, uh, Joseph Conrad guy, uh, <laughs> horrors upon horrors. It's, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that I could separate 
uh, I, I feel the drama, I feel the anxiety. Um, also in, 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 in New York, of course, um, uh, I, I mean, the world knows uh, just uh, how poorly uh, the pandemic has been managed. Uh, so constantly surrounded by death, you know, from just hearing sirens go off endlessly and even now uh, endlessly and seeing people being moved out of their houses uh, on stretchers. Um, uh, to even then having, you know, uh, people around me whose family members have died because of the corona, you know, like, uh, you know, it's become a daily kind of bulletin who's still living. Um, yeah, so as kind of an effort to uh, go into answering your question. And um, by the way, I, I am a product of the Group B education for uh, natives, not for Americans, for African natives. Um, maybe there's a typo in my bio. Um, part of uh, what that education system was, was uh, the British South African company was very clear uh, that the only way they were going to use uh, the natives and, you know, instead of annihilating them, at first they thought, let's just annihilate them and get the land. Uh, and then they thought, oh, okay, but maybe we could use them as a labor. <laughs> uh, but then maybe we could uh, uh, have them like skill up from just uh, feudal uh, peasants to something. So the education that they proposed um, uh, and probably is still in practice today has a lot to do with how to manage uh, white lives in the in the in the colonies, how to support white lives, how to work in the houses, how to work as farm hands, and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, it's kind of important me, for me to remind the world that uh, no matter where I go, um, I am a product of an education that was designed to make me a housemaid, you know, to, be, to, 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 to take care of the kitchen and the home uh, and just a reproductive labor. Um, and anything away from that goal has been uh, something that I have activated myself through my mother, who was fierce, <laughs> uh, to to you know kind of imagine uh, something something else, and um, and that's why these collaborations with uh, uh, Milo towards resistances, resistive practices, and why theater matters because you know for me these are spaces where. Uh, beingness is being discussed, can be discussed, can be articulated um, away from the kind of genocidal projects that were the colonial project. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. Nora, you mentioned the heart of darkness. I was determined not to use this phrase uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> because I know in DRC people don't like uh, to be referred to that. But in fact, it's it's a very you know very effective catchphrase um, for explaining why DRC and everything that's happening there is so far away. And in fact, looking at Milo's uh, film and the, the Congo Tribunal in general, it is to make this connect. But what is going on in Congo is not in the heart of darkness, but uh, it's something that we are uh, very much part of it and, and we belong to the conflict. We share responsibility, for instance, with each and every cell phone that we have in our pockets. That brings me to a question to Professor Welser with um, relating it a little bit to this afternoon's um, conversation when we talked about ah, what do we do as consumers. So, um, in fact, it was said, okay, if, if I'm going to buy my T-shirt at H&M, yes or no, uh, you know, is this the right decision, yes or no, because I might destroy... Um, uh, work, labor places in Bangladesh. How do you see, first of all, the awareness when it comes to the crucial element of cobalt and everything, the natural resources stemming from Congo, in how far what is going on in, in, um, in Congo today is part of our public consciousness? How much closer did it get to an awareness through 
the Congo Tribunal. And maybe you could uh, outline some changes, if there are any, in consumer behavior when it comes to, for instance, let's use cell phones as an example. Um, I think, first of all, this is a difficult question, but I think I have a very um, not so optimistic perspective on that because I don't think that awareness plays any role when it comes to the task to buy things, to have something new, to have this new model, to be object of all these PR things and whatever. So the problem with awareness and consciousness is that people have a lot of awareness and consciousness, but this doesn't cost anything. And it doesn't mean anything as soon as it comes to everyday practices. And the everyday practices in a society like the German society is consume, you can get whatever you want. So why shouldn't you have anything you want? This is the, you know, this is the, the, the basic rule of this type of society. So people don't care, even if they know. Uh, what the where the materials come from, uh, what human costs are in them, what ecological costs are in them. People know that. Maybe they know that, maybe some people know it, some don't know it, but they all do the same because they are, they are part of a culture where this type of behavior of consumerism is trained and is still trained every day. This is one thing. So I don't believe in awareness and consciousness. And uh, I understand Milo's work exactly in the opposite way, because um, the, 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 the issue of the Congo Tribunal is that we need legal action and tribunals like this and, um, and institutions that are able to work against all these kind of atrocities and things like that, and this type of uh, Haupttier capitalism. Um, therefore, I, I don't believe in consciousness at all. I mean, just to give you an example, we are now like 50 years, half a century uh, after um, the limits to growth. Yeah, a very important book in terms of starting ecological movements and things like that. Within this 15 years, since the publication of this study, Limits to Growth, everything has been growing bigger, more destructive, the cars are bigger, the styles of, um, of dealing um, with the world, with, uh, with resources, the way people do holidays uh, with cruise ships and all these things. Everything expanded during these 50 years. And of course, uh, the way um, the rich societies and the companies deal with the world that gives them the resources that they can use for this type of uh, growth capitalism uh, didn't change at all. So, if you ask people in Germany about environmental issues or about climate change or about colonialism, many of them would say, oh yeah, this is really a big problem, but it is really rarely related to concrete behavior. This, this is the problem. Yeah, thank you very much. I find this very interesting that this afternoon also it was said, well, that doesn't really matter. Uh, so exactly your same position, what we need is structural changes, legal changes, uh, and this would, um, this would be very interesting to hear, because this is exactly where the Congo Tribunal was trying to get to, so to lead to a, a structural change, to a legal change. This would be my question, uh, maybe particularly to, to Celine, to find out where maybe in the Congolese legal system, something has, has moved. And looking also at the hearings in Switzerland, but also uh, in, in Germany, where has uh, maybe the Congo Tribunal made it possible that some of the treaties, and particularly against 
the current situation where we have this massive, massive plans since 2019 ongoing, that Germany becomes possibly the biggest investor ever with foreign investment in the Democratic Republic of Congo, even larger investments than in uh, than the Chinese uh, uh, are currently underway to do. How does how does this fit together? Uh, the findings on the one side, the objections, the outcomes of the hearings, and where and in which institutions did you see any any cracks or movement maybe initiated through the Congo Tribunal? When it comes to progress that has been made, I'd like to refer to legal steps ahead, but it's not only thanks to the Congo Tribunal, although we've reached important awareness raising amongst the Congolese population by releasing those films and by showing them, but of course there has been legal progress because as you know, as you're aware, the mining sector is actually anchored in the mining code and some amendments have been made. So there's been a recast of quite a number of articles so that the Congolese population can identify itself with those articles a little bit better. Of course, it's also thanks to the Congo Tribunal that there have been modifications and changes, because ever since we released and showed the film, we found that most of the persons and participants have been really touched and moved and have been sensitized and have become aware of what was going on. So whenever things get organized in the course of the events, of course, it can push Congolese authorities to take responsibility as far as uh, what we're suffering is concerned. And if this Congo tribunal were to continue, it'd be a good thing and were to organize itself. It would be a gr great thing because if you meet uh, responsible persons in charge, politicians, then of course there are sometimes persons that get things going in their sectors, but of course also most of the authorities are not aware of what is going on and what they can do and how they can contribute to protect local communities that live on the ground of the mining companies and they don't know how to have their rights respected. So the Congo Tribunal is part and parcel, a very important and crucial element and aspect for the Congolese population because even if it is a fictitious tribunal, and even if the verdicts are fictitious, it is at least a tribunal that gathers stakeholders that provide their own points of view, their opinions, and they can push the Congolese government to take decisions at some point, and they could also push multinational corporations to finally respect the legal framework we have in the Congo and to see to it that the Congolese population can identify with what is going on, because it's quite miserable when you look at how people live on the ground in the whereabouts mm. of those mining companies. It's quite deplorable. Mm. Uh, Harald Welzer, when, um, would you be able to share with us uh, how you see the latest German investment and this absolutely big megalomaniac plan when it comes to the new um, key role that uh, the Democratic Republic plays uh, when it comes to the company Evagor and how they want to produce so much uh, green hydrogen that this might become a key role into the whole climate change debate in Germany. Uh, how, how do you see the situation of two, three years back when Germany was a smaller investor in DRC as opposed to today? What consequences to take from what we've learned and seen and heard in the Congo Tribunal? and? This very moment, is it time to to 
look at what Milo said in the end of the of the film. Let the future judge whether the Congo, uh, the Congo tribunal was right or wrong, even though it's a fictitious uh, tribunal. May, has this future already arrived? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, always the question when the future, what is the moment when the future arrives? I mean, uh, I, I think in this um, respect, it's more a question of uh, has the past come, come to an end? And I think we would agree um, to say no, because we are still in the mode of dealing with the world, with the world and with other populations in the very, from the logic, in the very same way it was done 100 years before or 150 years before. And um, therefore there is, no, there is no paradigm shift in the whole thing. Um, because, because companies and also uh, societies hosting these companies have still the idea that they have something like a, like a, um, like a natural right to do what they do and to exploit uh, everything where they can get in touch with and whatever. So this kind of paradigm, which is historically spoken relatively new, is still completely valid. And this makes our problems. And, there, and I'm afraid there hasn't been a change um, even uh, in the context of environmental discussions, movements for more sustainability and whatever, because the, the way how this culture deals with what is there is still driven by the same perspective, that things can be used, that uh, humans can be used as yeah, means to achieve something else and whatever. So there's no, no important paradigm shift in the whole thing. And if we look at strategies, um, or, I mean something uh, which makes this, I think, maybe clear the point that I have. When we face problems like climate change or other related things, environmental problems that are really, really, really severe. We have developed a concept that we have something like the idea that we can manage these problems while still going on with this type of growth capitalism. And the solution for this contradiction is that we don't have something like gray or, or red or whatever energy, but we have green energy. And we don't have gray or blue or red products, but we have green products. And we have something uh, like green exploitation. So this is something like an ideology in the framework of sustainability, awareness concerning environmental problems and things like that. So that in this respect, not much has changed. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something that I, I found very interesting yesterday also in the debate about, you know, how can you change this paradigms? Uh, because they are man-made. They are not like um, natural that, that they couldn't be changed. And in that respect, uh, yesterday the conversation was about the nature of trial as theatrical trials and uh, real world trials. I don't know what is a good contradiction. So the, the trials that take place in court and are not part of an artistic vessel. Um, this would be something that I would also find interesting from, to hear from Nora uh, in how far you also try with your kind of theatre work to to change things, but you do it in a completely different way, the way you work as a theatre professional, as a dancer. When you look at Milo's work and many others who use this genre or vessel of putting a trial on stage to um, try and duplicate it, but by duplicating also having an after effect on the real world. How do you, how do you look at this format? What, what does it do to you as a person and as a theatre professional? 
Um, I th I'm grateful f uh, to Milo for uh, constantly returning to this uh, form of the tribunal as, uh, as, uh, as a strategy to kind of shift uh, the public and uh, move perhaps even legislation. Um, the Congo Tribunal is is not his first. Uh, you know the Moscow trials or the Ceausescu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also in history, I think there's you know you can think about the Nuremberg or Tokyo uh, trials, or even the Truth and Reconciliation trials, uh, the Rwanda trials. Um, this this it's 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 a theater that is both living in the world of uh, 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 the state. Uh, but uh, implicates and affects the public in, in, in extreme ways. The law lives with us. So in my own practice, I, uh, I try not to separate uh, the us and them. You know, the body is carrying all this legislature in it. And I think one advantage that I may uh, claim to have, to have, if it's an advantage in my theatrical practice, is the fact of being black. You know, I can bring the accusation by my mere presence. You know, I am in the space, so therefore I already accuse. Uh, you know, I am very interested in this uh, um, proximity of uh, physical bodies to each other. Uh, the question uh, of, of uh, uh, who has the right to be here, who, who, who belongs here, is already being uh, uh, announced by my physical presence or by my placement of my body or my other performers' bodies in proximity to, to yours or whoever else in the room. We are already in a question of uh, uh, privacy, of rights. <laughs> Um, so yeah, my agitations are very confrontational, very physical, less about the, uh, the debate or the formality. I try to destroy the formality um, that uh, um, uh, court cases or courtrooms uh, or the ju 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 judiciary has. It's very formal. You have benches facing each other. You have a judge who sits a little bit higher than others. Uh, if if it's a jury system, you have jury that sits over there. So there is already a structure of separation uh, in in this in this uh, tribunal kind of uh, format. I try to remove that separation mm. so that you know it becomes a a, a, a really the risk is 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 really high uh, because there's nowhere to hide. There is nowhere to hide, um, I, and and I, I feel like that's 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 my provocation. That's my way of uh, advocacy. Um, if you can perhaps smell me, uh, uh, hear me, because the skin hears, um, and also hear me with all your senses, uh, and your spirit uh, uh, hears me. Um, I think maybe uh, there is hope for uh, a, a very real dialogue because of the physical proximity. I think one thing that uh, uh, the history of uh, at least Africa and the rest of the world, it's, it's, it's just this contestation of are they human? You know, is the other human? Uh, so yeah, I, I, I would like to bring that very uh, uh, in, into a personal space almost, into, into a space that's like, yes, I'm in your space. Well, can, you, can we now negotiate uh, this question, uh, not from a distance? Um, so, you know, I mean, of course you can imagine uh, how awful this kind of practice uh, could be in the age of the pandemic. So, you know, I'm <laughs> quickly trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what kinds of risk uh, we could uh, carry forth into our near future once bodies um, are, again, um, let's say, legal. 
uh, to be in the same space together. I hope that kind of sort of answers uh, yes. your question. The form of the tribunal, I think, is you know, it's 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 theater, whether it's in a. Uh, um, uh, you know, OJ versus the people, <laughs> or, or whatever. It's it, it it is theater. It is theater. I I I had the misfortune of studying law when I was much younger, um, and I found that's kind of one of the places that I could uh, develop my skills of presence. Of, 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 of acting, of uh, trying to make an impression, of to shift an opinion. So I, I think it is, it is theater, um, whether it is about legislating law or whether it's about uh, shifting people's opinions um, in a more civilian space. Thank you very much, uh, Noah. I find this inspiring and I would try to knit few ideas together uh, and also looking at an interesting question coming in from, from our audience. Um, the whole school of resistance is about, you know, trying to develop, discuss, debate and fantasize about ideas of how things could develop, of how artistic strategies could come. And uh, now that it's been said for a few times, oh, the structures are so um, strong, the paradigms, uh, as Harald Welser has said, they are so, um, uh, they, they have such an, uh, a power in itself that they are very difficult to change when we are looking at behavioral change. Now, what is it if we are looking at the at the strategy that Milo uses sometimes that is cooperating with the institutions so that maybe the behavioral change comes through cooperating with artists uh, inside the institutions. This relates, if I'm getting the question correctly, that is addressed to Nora and Celine. What can art do? What is impossible in the institutionalized legal structures? And how art and legal structures and other institutions can work together? So I think this question comes from the same point of uh, thinking of how uh, maybe we're, we are going and looking with new strategies into new sorts of maybe controversial, maybe cooperative ways of working with uh, institutions more than only looking at changes in the audiences. Who, um, uh, Celine, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe I will go first, oh, if you want. Uh, <laughs> Feel free, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so so I, I, I can only answer this again uh, from my position of, uh, you know, from a human from the global south, where institutions uh, have been oppressive uh, and uh, not at all helpful, I, I, I would say, you know, so my, my instinct would say, would be to say, let's, let's just see what happens without them. Uh, you know, so in, instead of cooperating uh, with institution, I mean, I mean, I think when you're talking about uh, institution or this question is really a, a global North kind of question where institutions actually work. You know, if you look at my country, uh, Zimbabwe, which has been uh, uh, happily allowed uh, to die since 1980, you know, I can I cannot uh, see myself being in a in a position where I um, I can think of how to uh, support an institution towards its survival. I would rather they all disappear and uh, and and trust that the individual humans have the wherewithal, the stamina to actually survive outside of institutional structures. Um, and, and I would propose that as an extreme radical decolonial kind of project uh, to allow you know, individuals to have power to, to decide for themselves 
what is good, what is helpful. Um, and I would say even allow younger people to have this power to decide what is good and what is useful. Anyone under 30 is thinking very radically different in Zimbabwe today than anyone over over that because of just the different circumstances that that, that they have lived in, in the country. I would allow um, young people to uh, have much more presence and, and, and determining anything, uh, whether it's education or how the bus system uh, runs or works. You know, I, w I would actually trust that the young people uh, could even do this better. I would also even trust that the rural populations, the rural populations know how to uh, deal with um, the so-called climate change, which again, I think is a problem that the West created and that Africa now just has to deal with because we are part of the planet. But I would trust that uh, a great deal of the rural populations know how to um, uh, uh, um, propose ways that are sustained, that, that can sustain the universe, perhaps not necessarily sustainable in the casual way, but can sustain humanity. I would also put a lot of trust in, 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 in women because women always just know um, what is, uh, what is uh, better ways to, to deal. So I, I would probably, I'm trying to avert sidestep this <laughs> step or this uh, question of uh, being uh, co-opted by institutions and say, perhaps I don't trust them. Perhaps their time, the time for them to disappear and die and new ideas come up is, is now. Um, so yeah, I would say a, a death for all kind of institution is, is, is a good one. Okay, I see Celine laughing. Uh, please share your view on uh, on what Nora has just been said, and maybe also come back to some examples of what, uh, for instance, you mentioned earlier the, the the case, the hearing, the investigation surrounding this truck, and what happened around the truck um, that that had a lot of very negative effects on the people who were. Um, affected by the sulfur that was spilled out of this truck. Let's look at that case, perhaps, uh, or any case that you, you find uh, illustrative. For instance, through your investigations, through your hearings, did you see any improvement, for instance, let's say, in the local police with regards to the living conditions of the, the people who... Who you, whose interests you as a human rights activist and lawyer try to protect? So, yeah, first of all, I'd like to second what Nora has just said. Uh, when it comes to institutions, I fully agree with her here. 100%. So when it comes to my own point of view uh, as regards art, whenever art helps to convey a message, it can be a very important element. I can remember when we organized the Gwambashi film on the 30th of June, this is what happened and had, it really did have an impact and it helped to bring across a very important message in order to point out that despite the fact that uh, you don't necessarily see it when you live in an urban area. There are people who suffer in more rural areas where mining companies uh, carry out their exactions. So when it comes to the institutional issue, institutions, political institutions in our case over here, overwhelmingly don't take the lives of their population seriously because there are so many problems, uh, so many abuses that take place. And if you look at the mining sector, you can see it most strikingly, but uh, uh, the Congolese government is ever hardly interested in those transgressions because the leaders of the country, some of them, also are shareholders to some of the mining companies. So whenever there are cases of pollution or cases of environmental destructions, well, most of the polluters 
are also interlinked with the political level, and so the political level cannot take any decisions. Uh, so corruption is also very rife. And as human rights activists, we've always uh, asked this question, we've always raised this question, and this is what I do in AfriWatch. What we do is that we see to it that communities on the ground see their rights respected, have their voices heard, whether it's uh, on the part of state institutions, also by multinational corporations. So most of the cases that we've investigated are cases that have given rise to serious damage to the life of local communities in some way or others. I mean, in some cases, mining companies, whenever they exploit resources, they don't respect living conditions or the necessary distance to be taken between the villages and the mining areas, the mining sites. There are also explosions taking place, which has an impact on the surrounding houses. There are cracks in the houses, in the walls, and also the air is polluted because mining companies also produce exhaust fumes, air pollution that has an adverse effect on the health of the population. So most of the communities, first of all, in the past lived off agricultural activities, but now they have given up their activities because their soil is contaminated by acid, so they can no longer produce any crops to make a living, and uh, sometimes companies also tell local communities to no longer use their crops because they've been so much contaminated, and this concerns water for people living alongside rivers that were polluted by the acids released by companies and fishermen that fished in the rivers no longer do so because there are no longer any fish in there. So there's so many all sorts of different cases like that where mining companies don't respect the rights of those persons. And when you get in touch with victims, it can be very difficult, can be very delish, delicate. And we are human rights activists. Whenever we become active, what we try to do is that we showcase reality the way it is and that we try to demonstrate what people's lives look like and we would want to show it to Congolese authorities that they do not assume their responsibilities when it comes to their populations and there's also a lack if you allow a lack of just and fair compensation indemnities damages being paid. So whenever a company destroys the soil or the land of the population, they are supposed to compensate for that damage. But often they only give crumbs to the population and there are people living off those crumbs so they're just being paid small amounts of money that they cannot even live off, they cannot even make a living off their daily lives. So institutions in the Congo in particular, they are not that much concerned about the problems encountered by their population. And whenever companies damage uh, land, soil, water, authorities or companies don't rehabilitate the land. So according to the legislation, there are, of course, uh, provisions to resettle populations so as to make sure that populations will not be faced with hardship and problems of that kind so that they can live in healthy conditions, so that they can go on living in good conditions. But whenever mining companies accept to resettle people, they take them to places where they cannot live because there's no drinking water available. There is no land, no arable land, and if it's and they cannot grow their crops there. So they quite simply cannot make a living there and authorities are not necessarily aware of that and don't take it seriously. So if this is resettling for the only the sole purpose of resettling without providing the right and proper conditions, it's no use. So they promise things to victims but they don't 
keep their promises and institutions cannot exert an influence on multinational companies. Okay. Because so many people are also, uh, politicians are so much involved as well in those corporations in some way or another. So local communities lose their identities at some point. You no longer recognize those communities. They are about to lose their cultures, their living environment where they've been linked by way of their great history and for ages they've dwelled there but the land can no longer be used. Cemeteries were destroyed so they no longer find their identity there. They're just faced with exploitation by mining companies. And thanks to the Congo Tribunal with Milo, whom I'd like to thank most warmly because the initiative is so great. It is such a fantastic thing to organize such a thing. It was just about pushing things forward and raising awareness amongst private and state institutions to sensitize them about the abuses going on and that local communities suffer from. Thank you. So us as human rights activists, we would like to ensure that we carry out advocacy work um, towards governments and multinational companies so that they respect the lives of the people living on the ground. So I believe yeah. that I've uh, answered quite vastly, quite comprehensively to your question. Yeah, and f with good reason. I think uh, from what you've been saying, from what the film says, from what we've heard in the hearings, uh, that your perspective has been only more enlightened. However, I would like to also hear Harald Welser's view on this. When we hear Celine talking very desperately about uh, the situation of there is no room, nothing is really changing when it comes to the collaboration uh, with institutions in Congo. How do you see the situation in Germany? Do we need to make a distinction between maybe private uh, institutions like entities like companies, multinational companies, and are there other bodies where you potentially see, yeah, there there is hope these institutions could change, be it the jurisdiction, uh, be it the police, uh, be it, I, I mean, we cannot just talk about the institutions without being a little bit more specific uh, about which institutions we talk. So are there at least any institutions where you see there is room to move that, for instance, the situation in Congo might be um, become uh, something of a, of a debate where from this side, from the official side, from the institutional or MNC side, things could change? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I find it really important to, to differentiate institutions because I think companies are no institutions, companies are companies uh, to, to do businesses in their way. And institutions, state-driven institutions, have in an ideal sense uh, the, the function to prevent these companies from doing illegal things and to protect people and whatever. So therefore, I think the idea that we have to get, get rid of all institutions is completely misleading because what happens without functioning institutions is exactly what Celine has described. I mean that these mining companies can do what they have done is because of the lack of functioning institutions. This is the thing. And to come back to, to how I understand the work of Milo and this type of theater is not duplicating institutions, but is to invent institutions that we need in the 21st century that don't exist. I think this is the crucial point. Um, and this makes it interesting because as long as, as long as we don't have this institution, like the General Assembly, to, to, uh, to mention another uh, work of Milo, uh, where large bodies of existing people are not represented in parliaments normally, here's the General Assembly where we can show 
what would happen if other groups of people are represented in the parliaments in, in democratic procedures. This is something like designing or sketching institutions that are necessary uh, in the state um, we, we are in now in the 21st century. And same with a, the with a tribunal and I think uh, with the Congo tribunal. And I think this is really important because we cannot imagine a world without institution. Uh, uh, think of, of people if you have something like, you know, rural people living in rural areas and have an idea of sustainability or whatever, but what is with their relate there with the relationship between men and women? What is the relationship to violence that are exposed by men to children or whatever? So we need institutions exactly to protect uh, people who cannot protect themselves against the violence of, other, of others. So therefore, it's really, really important to invent and establish new institutions that can deal with the problems we have now. For, for example, similar to the, to the um, uh, court in Den Haag that models the Congo Tribunal, we would need on a global scale a court for in, in environmental justice that is not existing or for environment uh, for global tax paying and things like that. So we need new institutions like that. And I understand this type of theater as model building for these necessary institutions. Hmm. Laura, would you like to um, react to that? I, can I just jump in? Yeah, yes, I, please. I, I just want to say uh, for new institutions to be born, the old ones must die. So it's not just, uh, you know, evacuate the space and not uh, put in something else. I want to just clarify that. I think the nature of human beings is always to uh, create ways in which uh, uh, safety, uh, you know, is happening and, and do no harm. I think, you know, uh, in, in my culture, at least, the less intervention from institutions, whether they be governmental or non-governmental, uh, uh, would would be better. So I, I, I think, um, uh, yeah, we, we have to also not uh, uh, use the universal whatever kind of language. The global north has different ways of functioning from the global south. And so to be hyper specific about each region and what they need and to allow the uh, populations to decide from, for themselves is what I am advocating. And, and I am saying that whatever structures they built, whether you want to then use this uh, word institution, whatever structures they want to uh, create for themselves to protect their well-beingness, whether it's uh, uh, safety or whether it's a food security or water security, um, I think they would, they would uh, come up with those, uh, um, with, 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 with those structures. So, yeah, I mean, the human nature has always created structures. Uh, the formal structures that come with uh, government, uh, you know, even schools, you know, education, it doesn't need to be the, the way it is. You know, we can get rid of universities, but that doesn't mean people won't learn. People will still be able to learn. We'll figure out different ways of gathering and exchanging and sharing information. So I'm being rather Africanist in this. Um, I'm taking a look here. I don't think we have so much more time, but the question from the audience that comes to Celine, uh, I think might wrap up, even though I would like to continue talking about this. It's, it's getting like really, really interesting and important, I find. But maybe to come back to a specific uh, example. The question to Celine goes, how do you organize the hearings for the ongoing Congo Tribunal in Colvesi? Do you have support by the official legal governmental structures or do you reject such collaboration? If okay for the panelists, I would like to give this opportunity to Celine to maybe wrap, wrap up uh, and say what the real collaboration 
is or is it happening, is it not happening, uh, and hoping for us to continue at this very crucial uh, moment with the School of Resistance tomorrow after uh, Celine tells us what's in reality happening in Colvesi. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so what is going on in reality in Colvesi? So, of course, we interact with provincial authorities, but whenever you try to take action, of course, you have to get in touch with official representatives, with authorities, in order not to uh, disrupt uh, public order or to provoke trouble here or to prevent us from holding the Congo Tribunal because we have to, of course, make our pleas towards these institutions themselves because if we want to be as efficient as possible, we have to also learn from them and explain to them what we are planning on doing. And it's on this basis that we can then carry on with the tribunal. And this is what we've been doing when we went to Kulwesi in order to interview the different victims and what we wanted to do is to get the opinions and the points of view uh, expressed by those authorities so that they tell us what they think of uh, about environmental pollution, what they think about what the victims accuse them of and what they envisage to do to provide remedy and how they react to what companies do to local communities. It's not not just environmental pollution or land and soil and river pollution, but there's also the whole issue of employment, of jobs, and the question as to whether multinational companies resort to local manpower, to local workers and individuals, because whenever you have interviews with those people, then very often you find that they don't necessarily resort to local workers on the ground who also have their skills, and even if they didn't go to university, they can nevertheless be employed in different categories of services. But most of our authorities are not that flexible, to be honest. And in particular, when it comes to Colvesi, when we wanted to talk about questions regarding mining, and as I told you right in the beginning of this talk, most of our authorities are also somewhat intertwined in the actions of mining companies, and there's a high level of corruption. And so sometimes they'll help one another. And whenever we present what we are trying to do, I can remember that we met two or three ministers in charge. and. Each of them, of course, told us about the beautiful things that they were going to implement and that they knew what they would do in the face of pollution, that they would compensate the population concerned and affected and they would push and put pressure on the companies. But when you look at what's really going on in reality, then you'll find that no such thing is happening and that nothing much is actually carried out in reality. So in, when you want to push forward things here, over here, you need to have approval of authorities. Of course, first of all, you have to explain very clearly to them what we're planning on doing. And in the case of the Congo Tribunal, we told them that we are not a tribunal that will pronounce their verdicts that will be applied, but it is just uh, some sort of a an advocacy work we're carrying out and that we would like to gauge their opinion regarding all sorts of different issues when it comes to uh, underground mining, uh, pollutions, problems there, whether the government is interested in those facts and the question that you just raised about the accident in Taki, whether the government, the provincial government was actually concerned about those things and was actually planning on assisting those victims because, to be honest, victims also suffer a lot of hardship. They lost limbs and they are not in a situation where they'd be able to do a lot for themselves. So in order to wrap things up in a nutshell, because you're asking me to do so, I can only summarize into three words by saying 
in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's not just here in the Congo, but it also holds true for other countries where the case is going on uh, like ours. But in our case, the Congolese population cannot identify and they cannot benefit from natural resources. Although we're living in a, in a very rich, vast country, very rich in mineral resources, but overall the Congolese population doesn't benefit from it. It doesn't trickle down to the population. They don't benefit from mines, raw material, riches, resources. So what I'd like to ask, and I'd like to make a call, it's via the Congo Tribunal that hasn't had a major impact on the ground, though, because our communities don't really necessarily have access to the internet to follow the hearings and to become aware of the films on the Congo in order to learn more about the situation. So there's so many difficulties we have to grapple with and we have to overcome. And this is why it is so important. This is why it is so crucial to be physically in touch with those people. And I couldn't agree with you more, Nora. So we have to go beyond just conveying messages with art. And we have to see to it that there is justice. But often these things take too long, so legal action takes too long, judicial processes often take years and years on end without victims being compensated, victims dying in between, victims losing hope because they no longer believe in having their rights recognized at some point. So this is uh, on this note that I would like to close and wrap up, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celine. Thank you, Nora and Harald Welzer. Um, thank you all who joined us for this very interesting panel from which I'm taking uh, that the strategies that are at the center of the school of resistance that need to be developed, uh, that there is a huge need of being very, very site specific and exactly looking at what strategies with who, in which institution, in which company. Uh, I think this is a, a massive, massive task. Uh, I'm under the impression that tomorrow at five o'clock, can there be global art? This will be at the very heart of uh, what will be uh, debated tomorrow at five. Before tomorrow at 4 p.m., aesthetics of resistance will take place. And at seven o'clock, Orestes in Mosul, the film by Mil Rao in, from 2020 will be screened afterwards a public debate. It's to me to say thank you to the School of Resistance and to everyone who has joined. Thank you also to the audiences who have asked questions. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>